John Henry Cole is captain. Boss man, do you ever pray? Well, if I miss this deal, let it humble get away. Mara be your barren day. Lord, Lord. Let it Mara be your barren day. John this is on mass bringing together stories of struggle and hope from the working class. I'm your host, Liz Medina. You are listening to episode four, titled My Father Swore the Kitchen Blue, featuring the story of Palmira Fernandez, a Spanish immigrant and switchboard operator. In the previous episode, we heard the story of a stone carver or cutter named Donegal. Unlike many of his fellow carvers, he managed to live into his golden years. He witnessed major events and changes in his time, and all the anxieties that come with those changes, such as the growth of Barry's immigrant population, the introduction of new machines, and two world wars. In this episode, we will listen to the story of Palmira Fernandez, who came over with her family from Santander, Spain, when she was a little girl. Like Donegal, her father was a stone carver, but he didn't want her to have anything to do with men like himself and Donegal. Palmyra's father knew the tragedies of his occupation all too well. Like many immigrant families, he wanted to spare his children from the hardships he faced and see them move up in the world. While Palmyra may not have ended up with a stone carver for a husband, she nonetheless faced hardships hardships that are familiar to working-class people throughout history. Number, please. Number, please. Number, please. Number, please. Number, please. That is a phrase Palmira Fernandez would have said hundreds of times a day during the 1930s. Back in the day, calls were connected manually. One operator told the New York Times that she said, number please, about 120 times per hour, eight hours a day. Operating a switchboard worked like this. An operator, like Palmyra, would have sat in front of a board filled with holes, called female jacks and flashing lights. Each time someone picked up a phone to make a call, a light would flash on her board next to the female jack corresponding to the caller's phone line. Palmyra would have then inserted a cable into the female jack and say, number please. The caller would have given her the number of their party. She'd reply with a yes thank you and then move the cable into the female jack of the desired party to connect their call. Palmyra would have done this for a wage that was probably less than today's minimum wage in Vermont which is $10.78 an hour. She probably worked for the Vermont Telephone and Telegraph Company. While I couldn't find any information on the average compensation during the 30s for operators at the Vermont Telephone and Telegraph Company, the wages for this job were notoriously low across the entire industry. Why were switchboard operators paid so poorly? Well, because they were women. Bell Telephone, the very first telephone company, originally hired teenage boys as switchboard operators. They quickly determined the boys were too rude and uncontrollable. It didn't take the telephone companies long to exploit the fact that girls are socialized to be more polite than boys. And girls could be paid only half to a quarter of the boys' wages. Today, working women in the United States earn anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of the wages of white men depending on their race, with Hispanic women earning the least. But even though the wages were low, switchboard operators were recruited from the more educated sections of the working class. Proper enunciation was a job requirement. Therefore, most operators had a high school education and were usually born in the United States. In the 1930s, having a high school diploma was a big deal. Back then, the national high school graduation rate was only around 30%. To give you some perspective, the national high school graduation rate today is 80%. 
the percentage of the population who have completed four years of college or more is 30%, which is about the same as just high school graduation rates in the 1930s. Palmyra's mom spoke broken English, and her dad was a stone carver. They came over on boats that were notoriously dangerous. At one point during the early 20th century, the average passenger mortality rate on boats carrying immigrants to the United States was 10%. They risked their lives and made sacrifices with the hope of a better future. To her family, Palmyra landing a job as a switchboard operator was an achievement. However, Palmyra had other dreams in mind. Palmyra's oral history was recorded by Mary Tomasi as part of the Federal Writers Project. It was likely recorded between 1936 and 39 during the Great Depression. Weiwei Wang will be performing Palmyra's story. Last year, while I was going with Pete, my father swore the kitchen blue, told me not to get serious over a stone cutter, though he's one himself and always has been. He meant well. I mean my father. He's had a brother and an uncle die from doing that kind of work. He doesn't want me to see any more of that. I keep telling my father that Bill... My current boyfriend will get a good job one of these days. He's been out of high school only two years, and jobs are scarce in Barry, unless you want to go into the sheds or quarries. He had a chance for a clerking job in Claremont, New Hampshire, but his people wanted him to stay home. He works three days a week at McDover's filling station. McDover used to be a stone cutter. He worked with my father. When his son finished high school, he was in Bill's class. He left the sheds and bought out a small filling station. He and his son run it together. Bill's father operates a derrick and does machine cleaning at the quarries. He lost two fingers of his left hand the day Bill was born. Someone came to tell him the news. He got so excited his two hands went careless with the machine and off went two fingers, snipped off clean. Bill's mother is Scotch. She's a cousin of Bill's boss, McDover. Whenever Bill's at our house, I try to keep the conversation away from religion. My mother is Roman Catholic to the bone, and she knows his mother is just a strong Scotch woman. There's a whole clan of us Fernandez in town all from Santander, Spain. I've never been there. My folks came over 29 years ago. A baby brother of mine, their first baby, crossed halfway with them. An epidemic broke out on board. Some fever. My brother died when they were five days out. My mother made my father go to the kitchen and ask the cook for a bottle, and she made him fill it with ocean water. It was all she could ever see of the baby's grave, she said. It's still in her dresser drawer at home. She takes it out on All Souls Day and Memorial Day and sets a bouquet before it. We've always lived in the same house on Burton Street. I was born there. My two brothers and two sisters were born there too. My mother can't see a hospital unless it's for an operation. Burton Street isn't an ideal residential section. None of the houses have more than two feet of front lawn and they're close together. But it's near the shed where my father works. At first they rented the house, now they own it. There are about a dozen sheds close by. When they're all going, they make an awful racket.
wash days my mother has taken to hang her laundry in the attic. She insists that the stone dust from the sheds sticks to the wet clothes. My sister Rosina is two years older than I am. She's entered the convent in Burlington. Next year she takes the black veil. I miss her. We see her only one Sunday a month. I wanted to teach, and look where I am. I started working here right after graduation, and planned to work only for the summer. It seems so good to be earning my own money that I decide to stay the year. Then I stuck. It's not a bad job. It was complicated at first, hard to get used to the switchboard. You get darn sick of saying, number please, and yes thank you. You got so used to those words, they're apt to roll out of your mouth any time. I was shopping in the dime store the other day, and when the clerk handed me my change, I said, yes thank you. I'm a telephone operator, but my mother has never got used to a phone. There's only one number she'll call, and that's my aunt's. If she needs groceries, she'll go downtown herself and get them, or she'll wait until one of us is home to phone the order. She doesn't speak much English. She's afraid of being misunderstood over the phone. She isn't the only one. You'll find plenty of foreign-born old people in town who hate to use a phone. It's a job to get my mother to go out of the house except for her shopping. She won't go to the movies. She's been twice in all the years she's lived in Barrie. But she heard my brothers talking about that new Chaplin movie, the one where Jack Oakey plays a part of Mussolini, and she surprised us by saying she'd like to see it. She has relatives, Spanish ones, who live near Mussolini's summer home. Occasionally, some friends of my mother will drop in for the evening. They talk and crochet. And once a month, faithfully, she goes to the women's night at the Spanish club. Except for that and for Sunday mass, she's content to stay home and sew. That was Weiwei Wang performing Palmyra's story. Weiwei is a native of Beijing, China, but has lived in the United States since age five. She currently works at the University of Vermont's Center for Rural Studies. Let's hear what Weiwei had to say. So I really related to Palmyra's story because I am also an immigrant. Um, I came over from China with my family when I was five. Um, And just reading her story, you know, the struggles that her mother was going through especially resonated with me. Because there are still a lot of immigrants who don't have the language skills and are embarrassed by it and maybe can't even get a good job. So, for example, a family friend, um, he's Vietnamese, and when he was back in Vietnam, he was a principal of a high school. But when he got to the States, he didn't speak any English, and he was a refugee, and he learned a little bit, but he ended up being a janitor at UVM. So, and people made assumptions about who he was and um, what he was capable of. And I think a lot of that happens now with immigrants. But the fact that she had her community, so she called Palmyra's aunt and she had her friends who are, I'm guessing, of Spanish descent and could speak Spanish. And she had the Spanish club community. For me, that that really resonated because in Vermont, as an Asian person, or specifically as a Chinese person, it's really hard to find community. And the fact that Palmyra's mother, she's content to stay home and sew. um, But I think that's because she has this community around her. Some people might think, oh, that's so sad that Palmyra's mother just stays in the house and never goes out. But I think that's because she has a community um, and she does keep in touch with who she is through her community and through her family. Um, And I think that 
a lot of immigrants are looking for that. And as the immigrant population grows in Burlington, I'm looking forward to see more Asian people specifically um, and what kind of resources are built through that. I also related to Palmyra's father not wanting her to marry a stonecutter, not in the same way, but when an immigrant family comes over, they really want their children who have grown up in the United States to achieve more. And for Palmyra, that was her marrying someone who's not a stonecutter. The fact that she had to give up her dream of becoming a teacher and work as a telephone operator instead, that was more helpful to her family, maybe, financially. That's still true of a lot of immigrant stories today, that Vietnamese principal slash janitor, um, he was doing that for the sake of her, his family because he had several children at home um, and he wanted to provide them with education. So working at the university was the easiest way for him to accomplish that, to achieve that American dream. A lot of Chinese families, they want you to be a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, those types of jobs. And there are a lot of us who don't want to do that, and we do it just because we have to. So that part of it also resonated with me. I think the differences between back then and now is that, you know, people could pass for anyone else until they opened their mouth. And so it was easy to just maybe go to the grocery store and not talk to anybody and not be judged. But nowadays, it's really hard for immigrants because a lot of us look different. It's important for people to recognize and to appreciate the immigrant community because they do contribute a lot, whether it's to services and jobs that people in Vermont do not want. For example, the dairy industry, you know, a lot of Latin American workers coming up, people are angry with that, but who else is going to do that work? And they're working so hard at it and they don't see their families, and they send all their money back home. And to the people who might work at the library um, who is an immigrant or might drive a cab or might be at a university, I think we need to appreciate all these people because they do bring culture to our community. Hearing Palmyra's story and Weiwei's commentary also got me thinking more about the issues of work, class, and immigration. I, too, have worked in the telecommunications industry. While switchboard operators like Palmyra are virtually defunct, I've worked in a call center. The same exhausting monotony Palmyra experienced and having to repeat the same lines and phrases over and over again is familiar to me despite our living in different times. In terms of monotony, I imagine it's much like factory work, but we produce services instead of widgets. But by the sheer merit of not having to get dirty, of being in a more genteel environment, switchboard operators, telephone representatives like me, and other low-level office jobs are thought of as white-collar jobs. It made me think about how our understanding of class can be more symbolic than real in certain ways. At the end of the day, I still had to carry out a very narrow set of tasks, dictated by my employer at the call center. And while many working-class families hope to one day get out of the factory and into the office, the majority of office jobs are not personally or materially rewarding. My job at the call center had me reading through the same script a dozen or more times per hour and paid me about 
$10.50 an hour. But, of course, there are differences in the working conditions of white-collar and blue-collar jobs, and other colors have been named to specify further differences in working conditions. There are gray-collar, green-collar, and, most relevant to the experiences of Palmyra and myself, pink-collar jobs. Pink-collar describes customer service jobs, or other work that is service-oriented. The color pink was chosen because service roles have, historically, been considered women's work and are still largely performed by women today. How do you think about class? Do you have a pink-collar job? Blue-collar, white-collar, gray-collar, green-collar? Were you a switchboard operator? Do you have an immigration story? Did you relate to Palmyra's story? Let's keep the conversation going. You can post your stories on our Facebook page, send us a tweet at Enmasse Podcast, or email us at enmassepodcast at gmail.com. That's E-N-M-A-S-S-E podcast. For the next episode, we will hear the story of an Italian widow named Melicenda, whose husband died young from working in the granite industry. In the early 20th century, there weren't any government programs to help widows like Melicenda, which is why Palmyra's father was so mad when Palmyra was dating a stone carver. Melicenda had to work hard and get creative in order to get by after her husband died. Unfortunately, the same is true today for those who can't access many government programs, like all the undocumented immigrants who keep our economy running. Thank you for listening. We have additional reading materials, archived footage, and show notes on our website. While there, you can give us feedback or suggestions for the next season. This is an independently produced show. I receive support from you, my listeners. If you like this show, go to onmasspodcast.com slash donate to show your support. Special thanks to Wei Wei Wang for this episode. The song, John Henry, at the beginning of our show is from the Alan Lomax Collection at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress, used courtesy of the Association for Cultural Equity. I'm Liz Medina. This is On Mass, bringing you stories of struggle and hope from the working class. Go